and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we have Thursday, the 8th of February 2018 and I've come to the table this evening to read to you the next part of the secret history of the Jesuits. Even though that the last two videos I haven't been reading so much out of the book itself, but that is only because this NDH situation, the situation of the independent state of Croatia, is so very much important. That is a genocide that is not very much talked about. That is history that is not very much talked about. And of course, you saw, I, I assume, <laughs> that when you watch this 22nd part, that you saw the part 21, where I was speaking with Tom Fress, who called me on Skype during the recording of the video. And he could explain why he understands that Avro Manhattan, in his book Terror over Yugoslavia, warns the people that what happened in the independent state of Croatia in the Second World War, what we were speaking about the last broadcasts, is a sh foreshadowing of things to come for the people in the United States of America and also for the Inquisition that is being reinforced here in Europe. Because the EU, the European Union so-called, is nothing else but the revived Holy Roman Empire of the time before the Reformation. And the question is only when they are getting their guns out. So, today I want to continue the reading in the paper that I left off yesterday. You probably remember we were speaking about um, Avro Manhattan and he was uh, at a dinner uh, in a di at a dinner party in Upper Brook Street, Mayfair, London in the late 1940s and met there Eleanor Roosevelt while he was doing research for his book that was Terror Over Yugoslavia, as you can see here, and of course um, the other one that is called The Vatican's Holocaust that he published in 1986. Now I'm not going back into what I've read here but I'm just going to repeat it, because I'm not going to comment on that. But um, I want to repeat this, and then we go further in this document, because we have still a few pages to go. Now, Avro Manhattan asked Eleanor Roosevelt if she had ever heard of the massacres and atrocities in the NDH. She replied, one of the worst, if not the worst, crimes of the war. I heard them in the winter of 1941-1942. Neither I nor my husband, FDR, at first believed them to be true. I did not believe them either, Manhattan told her. I assumed them to be propaganda. Well, we thought the same, replied Mrs. Roosevelt. And then she says something very profound. The Catholic lobby was the most successful at the White House for years. This is what the former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt tells Avro Manhattan, the author, who is, by the way, a Knight of Malta. She told him that, in the end of the 1940s, the Catholic lobby was the most successful at the White House for years. When you want to have more confirmation, I can even turn you to the video series that I did on my second YouTube channel, Joggler's War on Disinfo, Behind the Door from Bill Hughes. There are a few broadcasts where he deals with that, especially in the time of the First World War, for example, with uh, Woodrow Wilson's alter ego, um, Edward Mandel House, and things like that. And you will understand what the Catholic lobby in the White House was when she says here for years, and we just go back about 30 years at this time, well, that's of the time of the First World War, well, Edward Mandel House, the alter ego of Woodrow Wilson, the traitorous president of the United States of America, there you can learn about what Eleanor Roosevelt says here. So we're going to have here a little picture where it says German Nazis, Italian fascists and Croatian Eustachi, all together in one picture. Together with the papal nuncio Ramiro Macone, 
in his white cassock and the Archbishop of Zagreb, Aloysius Stepinak, in the black cassock. That is what we see here. here. That's him. Now, Avro Manhattan asked Eleanor Roosevelt if she was familiar with the Slovenian Roman Catholic author Louis Adamek. She replied that she was. Adamek had been one of the many who had persuaded her husband that the atrocities that the atrocity stories from Croatia had been concocted by the Nazi propaganda machine. So this is why she first answered, "We thought the same." Uh, when she said, um, "Neither I nor my husband at first believed them to be true," and Avro Manhattan answers, "I assumed them to be propaganda." because they fell for the propaganda of the Slovenian Roman Catholic author Louis Adamic, who um, had been one of the many people who had persuaded her husband and many other people that the atrocity stories from Croatia had been concocted by the Nazi propaganda machine. So they were not true, it was just Nazi propaganda. Why? Well, maybe to take the heat off the German atrocities that were going along at that time. Now, Avro Manhattan inquired if she could explain why the Catholic atrocities were not as well known as the Nazi ones. And here comes a sentence that you really have to read a few times to understand and to let it please sink in. He inquired if she could explain why the Catholic atrocities were not as well known as the Nazi ones. The reply of Mrs. Roosevelt is... Nazi Germany is no more. The Catholic Church, on the other hand, that's what I fill in there, is still here with us, more powerful than ever. With her own press and the world press at her bidding, anything published about the atrocities in the future will not be believed." Unquote. Now let us analyze this, was what Eleanor Roosevelt says here. Why were the Catholic atrocities not as well known as, uh, as the Nazi ones, the Catholic atrocities of the NDH? Well, Nazi Germany is no more, that's right. Nazi Germany was crushed by the Allies at the end of World War II. Absolutely crushed. The city where I come from, Hamburg, there are even pictures of that, you can find them on the internet, of course, was bombed to oblivion. Berlin was bombed to oblivion. Dresden was bombed beyond any recognition, with more than 500,000 souls, innocent souls, being killed in the firestorm and the bombing storm of quote-unquote Bomber Harris. Also, a lot of other cities got a lot of bombs on them like Cologne, like Munich, Nuremberg, Frankfurt probably too, a lot of the big cities. Nazi Germany is no more, she replied, and she is right with that. Nazi Germany is no more. Nazi Germany went also undercover. It took on the mask of communism. It took on the mask of democracy. But Nazi Germany today in 2017 is alive and well as it ever has been. It is just under the guise of the CDU, meaning the Catholic Democratic Union Party of Angela Merkel, the Chancellor. Yeah. The Catholic Church, Eleanor Roosevelt tells us, is still there, is still here with us. That's right. The Roman Catholic Church was there centuries ago, was there at that time, and will be until the time of Jesus returns. So, Germany they crushed, but the Catholic church is still there. And it is even more powerful than ever, with her own press and the world press at her bidding. Now, I'm not going into this now, but I just want to show you how easy it is to understand, um, let's just go to the Google page here, to understand that the Catholic controls everything. Intermirifica. Okay, you just type in Intermirifica, then you go to the very first link here, that is at Vatican VA, that is the Vatican website itself, and here it says blah blah blah, what it is all about, and um, here in this paragraph you already see what the Roman Catholic Church writes here. And this is 
from the Roman Catholic Church itself confirmation of what Mrs. Roosevelt said here, with her own press and the world press at her bidding. Why? Well, let's read. Intermirifica from the Vatican website. It is, therefore, an inherent right, a birthright does that mean, of the Church to have at its disposal and to employ any of these media in so far as they are necessary or useful for the instruction of Christians and all its efforts for the welfare of souls. It is the duty of pastors to instruct and guide the faithful so that they, with the help of these same media, may further the salvation and perfection of themselves and of the entire human family. In addition, the laity especially must strive to instill a human and Christian spirit into these media, so that they may fully measure up to the great expectations of, mankind's God, uh, uh, of mankind and to God's design." Unquote. Now, if you want to know what media are they talking about, well, you have this paper, Intermirifica, from Antichrist Pope Paul VI on the 4th of December 1963, and you have another one that is called... Um, oh, come on. <laughs> oh, not, not true. Oh, this is not possible that I forget that. Uh, Miranda, uh, Miranda Prozos. Miranda Prozos. Um, that is from a few years earlier, from 1958, and still under um, Antichrist um, Pope Pius XII, Hitler's Pope, published. And that deals with all the media, that deals with the printing media, that deals with the television, that deals with movies, that deals with the, uh, uh, any kind of media. It says here so in the beginning, such as the press, movies, radio, television and the like. And the like, of course, because at that time there were no social media. At that time there was no internet and there was no quote-unquote alternative media. But it is all implied in this Intermirifica and Miranda process such as the press, movies, radio, television, and the like, and so on. So I just want to show you this to you, that you understand that what Mrs. Roosevelt says here is absolutely true, and even from the words of, um, uh, of um, the Vatican itself, as we just read. Anything published about the atrocities in the future will not be believed. No, because you know, when you take the picture, the, when you take the work of the Roman Catholic Church, they did together with the Lutheran Church for the 500th anniversary of um, Luther's nailing of the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg, um, they did this paper together, the Lutherans and the Catholic Church, from conflict to communion. Yeah? And there it said, and I said that in earlier other broadcasts, I don't know if what a in the line of this one, but I, uh, then you have to look it up in my archive somewhere. That, uh, and by the way, there is a video out on my channel from Conflict to Communion Bilingual. It's, uh, I think, one of the only bilingual videos that I have from Conflict to Communion, from, um, from Conflict zur Gemeinschaft, um, where it says that uh, they don't want to tell a different history, but they want to tell history differently. And that's what Eleanor Roosevelt means here. Anything published about the atrocities in the future will not be believed, because they will tell it completely differently than it actually happened. Now, Manhattan, Manhattan then informed her that he was writing a book on the Vatican role in the atrocities in the NDH. Now, listen to what, her, what she, Eleanor Roosevelt, replies. Your book, she says, might convince a few. But what about the hundreds of millions already brainwashed by Catholic propaganda? What Catholic propaganda? Well, the Catholic propaganda of Intermirifica. That Roman Catholic propaganda. What you can read everywhere in the controlled press. Your book might convince a few, she commented, but what about the hundreds of millions already brainwashed by the Catholic propaganda? That are those people who take videos like this and then comment that it is all not true, because they read here and there this and that. 
and they don't base their research like I do on the Bible and true history. And this article that I'm reading here is true history. This intermirifica is true papal history. This is from the Vatican website itself. Everybody can look it up as easily as I did in the search engine. Just type intermirifica. Huh? It is that easy. Your book might convince a few, she commented, but what about the hundreds of millions already brainwashed by the Catholic propaganda? Yeah, those are, I guess, lost souls. Now, Manhattan recalled a few years later, in 1953, when the book was eventually published, although two editions were sold within weeks, no part of the British or American press dared even to mention it. Adamic you know that Roman Catholic, uh, uh, that Roman Catholic writer here from um, that Slovenian Roman Catholic author, uh, Adamic, that guy. He wrote that quote the atrocities were all propaganda to stir up anti-Catholicism. Yeah, that's the same that they're gonna say about the broadcast, like I do, that I am anti-Catholic, and I am. I am anti-Catholic, I am pro-Jesus Christ. And when you are pro-Jesus Christ, you cannot be pro-something else too, and certainly not pro-Satan. And the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. The atrocities were all propaganda to stir up anti-Catholicism. Yes, when you are a Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christian, you are anti-Catholic, because Catholicism is the Bible 180 degrees turned around. It is Satan, and not the God of the Bible. Now FDR knew of the genocide in Croatia and Bosnia, and was appalled to the point that he did not think it possible for Serbs and Croats to live in the same country. In the book Roosevelt and Hopkins, an intimate biography, which was published in 1948, uh, one of FDR's closest advisors took notes on the meeting held on March 15, 1943, between FDR and Anthony Eden, the British Foreign Secretary at that moment. They discussed the post-war European landscape. Regarding Serbia, FDR was, an a was adamant that Serbs and Croats should not be in the same country. The President expressed his oft repeated opinion that the Croats and the Serbs had nothing in common and that it is ridiculous to try to force two such antagonistic people to live together under one government. He, the President, thought that Serbia itself should be established by itself and the Croats put under trusteeship. At this point Eden indicated his first obvious objection to the trustee method, which the President is going to propose for many states. Eden did not push it, but it was clear to me that the British government have made up their minds that they are going to oppose this. Eden thought the President's opinion about the inability of the Croats and the Serbs to live together a little pessimistic, and he, Eden, believed it could be done. Yeah, it could be done in the then together put state of Yugoslavia after the Second World War, putting in the communist leader of, uh, what was his name, Tito, I think. And then, of course, the breaking up of Yugoslavia again in the early 90s. And then what did you have again? You had again a war against the Serbs, against the Orthodox in the late 1990s just uh, 15 years, 16 years from where we are now, uh, no, we are 2018, so 19 years ago, 19, 20 years ago. Now, what was the Vatican reaction to the NDH atrocities? How did the Vatican react to the genocide committed in the NDH? Not only did the Vatican deny and ignore it, but it took an active part to hide and suppress it and to protect the perpetrators from prosecution and justice. After the war, the major planners of the genocide, Poglavnik Ante Pavelik and Andrija Artukovic, were helped to escape by the Vatican through the red lines. Dinko Sakic and Vyokislav Max Luburik also escaped. 
a Croatian Roman Catholic priest, Krunoslav Draganovic, who himself had been a part of the Eustasha and the H regime, organized and masterminded the escapes. In addition, he was able to launder the assets that were seized from Serbs, Jews and Roma in the NDH. The Vatican has never acknowledged its role in the genocide committed in the NDH. This is genocide denial. It is denial of the Holocaust. The Vatican protected the accused Eustasia war criminals and assisted them in escaping prosecution for war crimes. In the book Pius XII, The Holocaust and the Cold War, from Indiana University Press 2008, Fayer shows that the Vatican put diplomatic pressure on the US and the UK not to apprehend Ante Pavelic or any other wanted Eustasia war criminals. US intelligence had located Pavelic but was prevented from arresting him. Why would the United States not arrest arguably one of the most notorious mass murderers of World War II? Why would the United States help to shield an accused war criminal suspected of committing genocide? Why and how could such a fanatical fascist accused of genocide escape arrest and prosecution? Why was Ante Pavelic allowed to escape to Argentina by the US government? Now allow me that I bring back to your memory the book that I am going to read in a later part of the same reading of uh, The Secret History of the Jesuits, I will include Chapter 3 of the book The Real Odessa by Yuki Goni, How Peron Brought Nazi War Criminals to Argentina, and also, also of course, Nazi War Criminals from the NDH. This complete book deals with that. I've started reading that some time ago. I think I read about the first 60, 70, 80 pages, something, I don't know. I started reading in English, then I got the same book in German, because in German it's also very interesting to have. Because, of course, about helping Nazi war criminals escaping is in interesting information for German people who often don't have that information. And I am going to read this chapter 3 of The Real Odessa from Ukigoni, and there we will come back into everything that I just asked here. Why would the US not arrest? And so on and so on. So all this stuff will be dealt with when I read the part of the real Odessa. And in the meantime, you can go to any search engine on the internet, type in the real Odessa by Ukigoni or just the real Odessa, and you can order that book for yourself, as I did, and read it for yourself, and do your own research, and you don't have to rely on the conclusions that I make after reading those works. Now, why was Ante Pavelic allowed to escape to Argentina by the US government with the help of Perón? Well, the answer is that the Vatican orchestrated his escape. Why? Fayer quoted US counterintelligence corps agent William Gowan, the son of Franklin Gowan, a U.S. diplomat in the Vatican, who reported in 1947 that Pavelic's, quote, contacts are so high and his present position is so compromising to the Vatican that any extradition of the subject would be a staggering blow to the Roman Catholic Church, unquote. Pavelic and the other Eustasha, war criminals guilty of genocide, were allowed to escape to protect Vatican. They were allowed to escape to protect the Antichrist, that no one comes to the idea that the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist always was, was at that time and still is today, the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church. Both Britain and the United States could have arrested Pavelic and the other Eustasha war crime suspects, but choose not to, enabling them to escape and to elude prosecution for war crimes and for genocide. In Hunting Evil, the Nazi war criminals who escaped and the quest to bring them to justice, published by Random House 2009, Guy Walters, or Guy Walters, documented a United States CIC report that stated 
that the British had allowed Antipavelic to escape. In October 1946, a CIC report stated that, quote, there can no longer be any doubt that the British aided the escape of Dr. Antipavelic. The US also knew of Pavelic's location, but refused to arrest him. Now, Walters showed that the US knew where Pavelic's, uh, where Pavelic's um, daughter lived, as she reported regularly to US occupation authorities. According to Walters, the British reported that, quote, it's no use trying to get Pavelic. The Yanks are backing him, unquote. In August 1947, United States CIC agent William Gowan reported that Pavelic was, quote, receiving the protection of the Vatican, unquote. Why were Britain, the United States and the Vatican all helping Pavelic to elude capture? Gowan wrote that the Vatican opposed the extradition of Pavelic because his capture would only, quote, weaken the forces fighting against atheism and communism in its fight against the church. <laughs> Unquote. Weaken the, weaken the forces fighting against atheism and communism. And in the meantime, the forces of atheism and communism fight the papal crusade against the orthodox. That is not mentioned. In other words, the Serbs would only benefit. The orthodox would benefit. The Russians would benefit. And ultimately communism and the USSR would be the beneficiaries. It was a zero-sum game. Key bono. Who benefits? Who would gain if Pavelic was arrested and prosecuted for war crimes and genocide. Well, I can tell you who would profit and who would gain if Pavelic was arrested. Truth would prevail. Jesus Christ would prevail. People could get to know Jesus Christ if that happened. If that link of Poglavnik Pavelic was put to the Roman Catholic Church on a worldwide scale, people would all of a sudden maybe wake up and see the Roman Catholic Church is not Christianity. The Roman Catholic Church's quote-unquote father, the Pope, is not the vicar of Christ, but is a war criminal and is actually wearing his mask over the head of Satan means he is the vicar of Christ, but not the vicar of Jesus Christ, but he is the vicar of Satan on earth. That would happen. That would be the beneficiaries if Pavelic was arrested and prosecuted for war crimes and genocide. So certainly the Vatican would not gain anything. Only the Orthodox would benefit. Only the Protestants would benefit. Only the truth would benefit. Only the Serbs would benefit. Only communism would benefit, the author says here. Only the USSR would benefit. This is how the Vatican sold the idea to the US government. Arresting Pavelic would be detrimental in the Cold War against the USSR. And this Cold War against the USSR was a joke from the beginning. Because this Cold War was financed by Wall Street. Not only Wall Street, but by the Vatican, first and for all, by the Knights of Malta, by the Jesuits. They always play both sides of the medal, people don't forget that. The Cold War was a joke. This had much wider political implications. If the Vatican were discredited, the Communist Party in Italy would benefit, which might allow it to win the elections. The United States supported democracy in Italy only if a non-communist party won the elections. Because the Italian Communist Party was poised for victory in Italy, the United States did everything it could to rig the elections, to deny democracy. Moreover, this had the potential to set off a chain reaction for other parts of Western Europe. More importantly, it would reveal the true core of Roman Catholicism to the mass public. People would see that the Vatican was corrupt and hollow at its center. 
obsessed with power at any price, even genocide. It would show the moral bon bankruptcy of the Vatican or the Roman Catholic Church. The moral bankruptcy of the Roman Catholic Church. It would expose the Roman Catholic Church for the synagogue of Satan that it is. And this could not be allowed to happen. Especially not during the ideological conflict of the Cold War, which was ultimately a contest for the hearts and minds of the people. The Vatican could never acknowledge that it was complicit in genocide, even though the evidence is abundantly clear that it was. The largest religious denomination in the United States is Roman Catholicism at 23% of the population. And don't forget to count in all the evangelical ecumenical evangelibellies all the people who have been, all the quote-unquote Protestants, who have been lured via the ecumenical movement into Roman Catholicism without even their knowledge. But their pastors preach Roman Catholicism from their pulpits and not Protestantism. People don't even know what a Protestant is anymore. I'm sorry to say, but that's the way the cookie crumbles. You can like it or you can dislike it, but that doesn't change the fact. The largest religious denomination in the United States is Roman Catholicism at 23% of the population, not counting the ecumenical evangelical valleys. There are over a billion Roman Catholics globally. The decision was an easy one for the United States. As a result, Pavelic was allowed to settle in Argentina and live a comfortable life there, while Artukovic was allowed to settle in the United States itself living in Seal Beach, California, as a model American citizen. The Vatican continues to suppress information on its role in the NDH. John Cornwell, uh, you know, the author of the book Hitler's Pope, here in the picture, John Cornwell noted that, quote, more than half a century after the war, the Vatican has still failed to make a clean breast of what it knew about the Croatian atrocities at the early stages of the final solution and when it knew it. Unquote. Here in this picture we see the Vatican legate Ramiro Marcone, third from the right. That's here. Aloysius Stepinac, that is the cardinal, first on the right, over here and Poglavnik Pavelic, partially obscured far left. Here, you see him. At the 1944 funeral for Marco Dosen, the president of the Eustasha parliament. Now, in this paper we come to a conclusion. The conclusion is, the Vatican denied and ignored the role it played in the genocide committed in Croatia and Bosnia during World War II. Moreover, it took an active part in concealing and suppressing not only the genocide itself, but its role in that genocide. Finally, the Vatican acted to protect the perpetrators and to shield them from prosecution and justice. The Vatican has never addressed these issues. And then we only come to the footnotes, which I will show you for a moment so that you know that all the quotes are sourced and the sources are here in the footnotes okay just for you to know where all this are taken from and the source of this pictures pic, uh, of this paper is um, serbiana.com analysis archives 1182 and um, i have to thank the author Kao savage who put this together and I read this during my explanation of the book reading The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. And we are going to return to this book right now. We left off last time that we read in the book on page 151. And I'm going to read to you this last paragraph that I already read. But to come back into this, and we are having about two pages to read to the end of this chapter. 
this chapter that is still called um, uh, what's what's it called? <laughs> yeah, I should have wrote. I should have written that somewhere. <laughs> anyway, you will see that in the beginning of the video what it's called. It's still the infernal cycle, of course. We might as well leave this peculiar bishop to enjoy his clear conscience. This primate of Croatia supposedly stripped of any authority, calling himself metropolitan when he wasn't so, and who? to crown the paradox was opening doors when shutting them. But at the side of this fantastic prelate there was another one, consistent and corpulent R. P. Marcone, personal representative of Pius the Twelfth. Now let me just go to the right pictures and I have to see where uh, where is Marconi. Is Marconi before this or is he behind this? Ah, Marconi is before this, so here we have the pictures of Marconi. Here you have him uh, with Stepinak and his wife dressed in white. And here you have him sitting next to Pavelic. Okay, This is Marconi. Was this Sancti Sedis Ligatos, which means Holy See's Envoy, was this Holy See's Envoy also destitute of any authority over the Croatian clergy? Nobody knows, for the dossier so well expurgated, expurgated, <laughs> the dossier so well expurgated makes no mention whatsoever of this great person. We could even be oblivious of his existence if we didn't have other information, such as photographs. Look to the right which show him officiating at Zagreb's cathedral, enthroned amongst Eustachy, general staff, and above all sharing a meal with the family of Pavelic, the practicing Catholic who organized the massacres. Confronted by such a document, it is not surprising that the presence of the Pope's representative was quote-unquote blacked out. The mystics would call this enlightening darkness. But these few lines from the dossier are even more enlightening. Quote, the procurator himself, in his bill of indictment, names the Holy See Secretary of State, Cardinal Maglione, who had, in 1942, advised Archbishop Stepinac to establish more cordial and sincere relations with the Eustachy authorities. Unquote. This is sufficient to put an end to any more quibbling. The collusion between the Vatican and the Eustachy murderers is clear enough. The Holy See itself was urging Monsignor Stepinac to collaborate with them, and the personal representative of Antichrist Pope Pius XII, by taking his place at Pavelic's table, was applying the pontifical instructions to the letter. Sincerity and cordiality in the relations with murderers, with murderers of orthodox believers and Jews and gypsies and protestants. But what do the Jesuits, this does not surprise us, does it? But what do the Jesuits think of it all? As they obstinately affirmed that the constant cooperation given to the dictators by the prelates of his holiness was an option entirely personal and not dictated by the Vatican. Now, Cardinal Maglione, I have to switch to another picture here. Let's see where I have him. Um, this is Italian fascist minister Dino Alfieri. When he visits the Vatican with Cardinal Maglione on the 7th of December in 1939. So here you have of course, in this uniform, the Italian fascist minister, Dino Alfieri, and here you have Cardinal Maglioni on the 7th of December in 1939 in the picture. Now, when Cardinal Maglioni sent the previously mentioned recommendations to Zagreb's archbishop, was it his personal opinion he expressed under the seal of the state secretary office? The proof of the connivance between the Holy See and the Eustaches, supplied by the RP Dragoon, which has just been mentioned, puts an end to this chapter. 
but here is a new confirmation of the evangelical sentiments which flourished and still flourish amongst the faithful of the Croatian Catholic Church toward the Orthodox Serbians. The Fédération Ouvier Croate en France, which stands for the Federation of Croatian Workmen in France, sent out an invitation to the solemn meeting organized for Sunday, 19th of April, 1959, at the, quote, General Confederation of Christian Workmen, unquote, center in Paris, to celebrate the 18th anniversary of the foundation of the Eustachy Croatian state. The invitation read, listen closely. The ceremony will start with a holy mass, being set at the Church of Notre Dame de Lorette. But the reader, edified by this pious start, is the more startled when he discovers soon after his straight exhortation. Death to the Serbians. So this is not so banal uh, this is not so banal document expresses the regrets that not more of these brothers in Christ were killed. The book of the R.P. Dragoon, rector of the Croatian mission in France, implies that the welcome given by the French Catholics to the Croatian refugees was not warm enough. We are told this on pages 59 and 60 and on pages 280 and 281. The author mentions the grievous disappointment these refugees experienced at, meet, uh, at being met by a total lack of understanding on the part of their brothers in the faith." Unquote. Considering the aforementioned document, this lack of understanding seems comprehensible. We are glad that our fellow countrymen, in spite of the most grand invitations, show little sympathy to a form of piety in which the call to murder walks hand in hand with the Holy Mass in the best Roman and Eustachy tradition. We would, even, we would be even more glad if such bloodthirsty tracts were not allowed to be printed and distributed openly in Paris itself. Now let me change the picture again. On the 10th of February 1960, Edmond Paris continues, the infamous Archbishop of Zagreb, Alois Stepinak, died at his native village of Karlovice, where he had been made to reside. Uh, he was arrested at home. Uh, he had home arrest. This death gave the Vatican an opportunity to organize one of its spectacular manifestations for which it excels. On that occasion, a lot had to be done as many Catholics had no illusions as far as, Stepina, as the Stepina case was concerned. So the Holy See surpassed itself to give this apotheosis all the pump possible. The Osservatore Romano, that publication by the Jesuits that you know already, and all the Catholic press dedicated many columns to the rapturous praises of the quote-unquote martyr, his quote-unquote spiritual testament, and the speeches of His Holiness, Antichrist John the Twenty-Third, proclaiming, quote, his respect and supernatural affection, unquote. These were the motives which prompted him to give to his cardin to this cardinal, who was not part of the curia, the honors of a solemn service at St. Peter's in Rome, where he himself would give the general absolution. And to complete this glorification, the press announced that the beatification of that illustrious person would soon be started. We must admit that he deserved so much praise, and even the halo, for having observed the holy obedience and carried out to the letter the pressing instructions of the Holy See concerning the cordial and sincere relations wished for between himself and the Eustaches. But, even amongst Catholics, we hope that some will be found who will discern 
behind the exaltation of this future saint and the burial under flowers of the bloody souvenirs of his apostolate, the attempt of the Vatican to hide its own crime. And this brings us to the conclusion of this chapter in The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. Next time we are going to continue in section 5 and chapter 4 with the title of the, Jesuits move, the Jesuit Movement in France before and during the 1939-1945 through 1945 war. But that's for another moment. Today I am still not done. I am far from done. Now let's see, we have already 45 minutes, so I guess it's probably being a little bit more than an hour, but that is not so important. I really have to read this to you and I'm going to do this right now. We have here a newsletter from Richard Bennett from the website Berean Beacon. Um, Richard Bennett worked together in this paper with Michael Desemlian. And you know Michael Desemlian when you know my channel as the author of the book All Roads Lead to Rome, which I read in German and in English on my channel. He did a continuation of that book that was called The Foundations Under Attack that Tom Fress read in 2017 on First Amendment Radio and Inquisition Update. And so Richard Bennett, who was for 22 years a a uh, priest in the Roman Catholic Church and then by the grace of God was saved and came out of it, together with Michael de Semlian wrote a paper on the 29th of December 2015 that is called The Appalling History of Croatia in the, 20, uh, in the 20th Century. Therefore it does not exclusively deal with the happenings of the Second World War, but it deals with the history of Croatia. The in the Second World War called NDH, Independent State of Croatia. And I want to read to you this paper from Richard Bennett and Michael de Semlian. And with that I'm going to close the subject of Yugoslavia and Croatia in the Second World War of the book reading The Secret History of the Jesuits of. And we are going to read this right now. In 1929, Richard Bennett and Michael de Semlian say, Mussolini signed the Lateran Treaty along with Antichrist Pope Pius XI, officially conceding Vatican Hill to the Pope. The papacy once again became a sovereign civil state. The legal agreement between Mussolini and the Vatican was just the beginning. Following this, the papacy formed alliances in the 20th century with Roman Catholic dictators such as Adolf Hitler of Germany, Francisco Franco of Spain, Antonio Salazar of Portugal and Juan Perón of Argentina. You remember me? The book of Ukigoni? Huh? Perón and how he helped the Vatican to bring Nazi war criminals into Argentina. Okay? But the alliance that proved to be the most brutal and bloodthirsty of all was that between the papacy and Anton Pavelic in Croatia. Within the papacy it was agreed that Anton Pavelic was to be head of the new nation-state of Croatia which was carved out of Yugoslavia during the Second World War. And you have seen the map in the last video so I spare you that adventure right now. During Pavelic's four-year reign, between 1941 and 1945 that is, he and Roman Catholic prelate Archbishop Alois Stekinac, Stepinac, later Cardinal, pursued a convert-or-die policy among the 900,000 Greek Orthodox Serbs, Jews and others in Croatia. 200,000 were converted. The 700,000 who chose to die were tortured, burned, buried alive or shot after digging their own graves. You've seen the pictures in the last video. This appalling persecution carried out by the Eustachi included many of the worst atrocities of history. The mutilations were horrific, the tortures vicious, the savagery terrible. 
The Roman Catholic Church did not leave the execution of a religious war to the secular arm, as they did during the Inquisition, by the way. Then uh, there was a spiritual court condemning the quote-unquote heretics to death, but the secular arm was then to, ex uh, to execute this, um, these uh, judges. Um, yeah, I, um, what I, I don't know, what is that in English now? When you are, uh, the sentences, these sentences, yeah? But here, the Catholic Church did not leave the execution of a religious war to the secular arm. The Roman Catholic Church was there herself, openly ignoring precautions and bolder than she had been for a very long time. Why was she bolder than for a very long time? Because she had been set off her temporal power, the Roman Catholic Church. The time between 1866 and 1929. That's what this article just started with. The Lateran Treaty of 1929, when Mussolini gave the temporal power back to the Vatican, and by that the wound was healing that was mentioned in Revelation 13. The Roman Catholic Church did not leave the execution of a religious war to the secular arm. She was there herself, openly ignoring precautions and bolder than she had been for a very long time. Wielding the hatchet or dagger, pulling the trigger, organizing the massacre, the Roman Catholic priests tortured and killed, and even nuns were used for that. Many of the Eustachi officers were priests or friars sworn to fight, quote, with dagger or gun, unquote, for, quote, the triumph of Christ and Croatia, unquote. Priests played a prominent role in the closing or takeover of Serbian Orthodox churches, the seizure of church records, and the interrogation of the Serbian Orthodox clergy. They also supervised concentration camps and organized the torture of many of their victims. French author Edmund Paris, who was, a, who was born a Roman Catholic and has written a very thorough account of this terrible massacre in his book, Convert or Die, so this is another book than the secret history of the Jesuits that we are reading for the moment, has said, quote, it is difficult for the world to believe that a whole people could be doomed to extermination by a government and religious hierarchy of the 20th century just because it happened to belong to another ethnical or racial group and had inherited the Christianity of Byzantium rather than that of Rome. Unquote. This is a sentence you have to maybe reflect a little bit about. Maybe you read it for yourself quite again Put the video on pause, read it again, and think a little bit about it, what Edmond Paris says here. I'm going to repeat it. It is difficult for the world to believe that a whole people could be doomed to extermination by a government and religious hierarchy of the 20th century just because it happened to belong to another ethnical and racial group and had inherited the Christianity of Byzantium rather than that of Rome. Now, problem is a little bit the time. Huh? We are already about 50 minutes, 53 minutes. I don't want to go too deep into this. But this little sentence can be analyzed so deeply that it takes an hour or two in an own video, in a, in a video of itself. Look, the point that I want to make here is, we are speaking about the Christianity of Byzantium. So this speaks about the Orthodox as we have already learned before. But you can also apply this to the Jews that have been killed by the Germans. Yeah? It is difficult for the world to believe that a whole people, the Jews, could be doomed to extermination by a government and religious hierarchy of the 20th century just because it happened to belong to another ethnical and racial group and had inherited Judaism rather than Catholicism. You can read it that way too. And you can also understand this in the light of the last broadcast that I did with Tom Fress, where he proved that 
in the book Terror over Yugoslavia from Avro Manhattan, we can understand from that chapter that he read that the things that happened in Croatia in the Second World War are a foreshadowing of things to come to the United States of America. Now read the sentence from Edmond Paris this way. It is difficult for the world to believe that a whole people, the United States of America, Americans, could be doomed to extermination by a government and religious hierarchy of the 21st century just because it happened to belong to another ethnical and racial group and had inherited Christianity from the Bible rather than that of Rome." Unquote. How is that for understanding? How is that for a warning to my brethren, brothers and sisters over there in the United States of America? Read that sentence quietly for yourself. Put the video on pause. Read it. Think about it. Read it again. Think more about it. Write it down. Copy it. Go to the website bereanbeacon.org and get this blog for yourself and read it and understand it. It is difficult for the world to believe that a whole people could be doomed to extermination by a government and religious hierarchy of the 20th century just because it happened to belong to another ethnical and racial group and had inherited the Christianity of Byzantium rather than that of Rome. The creation of the entirely Roman Catholic independent state of Croatia during the Second World War was accompanied by a persecution so ferocious that it is difficult to find a parallel in all of history. The Inquisition applied to the Serbian Orthodox by the Croatian Catholics count accounted for 700,000 Serbs being tortured and killed in just four years. So while the Inquisition ended in the 19th century, quote-unquote, officially, she never ended, actually, the same procedures and mindset were evident in Croatia in the 20th century. In fact, the same mindset is still officially maintained by the papacy in the 21st century. The Roman Catholic Church to this day maintains the laws that she used as her authority to torture and murder Bible believers for over 600 years. In her present day laws she states her right to coerce Christian people. Now, before I go into this, a little explanation. Richard Bennett was a member of the Roman Catholic Church for 22 years. He is perfectly trained to understand Latin. He reads all the publications of the Antichrist that first come out in Latin and even understands them in the original language. And then, and that is the most important part, he doesn't only read and understand Latin, he also understands the casistry and sophistry, which is in the short word Pope speech. He understands Pope speech and by that he analyzes the canon law. Therefore, he says here, thus, Canon 1311 states, quote, The Catholic Church has an innate and proper right to coerce offending members of the Christian faithful by means of papal sanction. The Church has an innate and proper right. Where did we read that? When we go to Intermerifica, what does it say here? An inherent right. Isn't that the same as an... Um, in, uh, innate and proper right? <laughs> I think so. I'm not an English uh, expert or expert of the English language, but I think that those words are probably interchangeable. So that means that the Catholic Church has an innate and proper right to coerce offending members of the Christian faithful by means of papal sanctions. And of course with Christian I mean Catholic. Huh? While there are no sanctions in torture and death at the present time, the same astonishing mindset is Roman Catholic law. 
The fact is that the papacy still claims the right to judge and impose chastening that has not changed since the days of the Inquisition. In present day, 2018 even, Canon Law, she also decrees in Canon 1405, Section 1, quote, It is the right of the Roman pontiff himself alone to judge in cases mentioned in Canon 1401.1 those who hold the highest civil office in a state. And in Canon 1401 it says, quote, By proper and exclusive right the Church adju uh, adjudicates. 1. Cases concerning spiritual matters are connected with the spiritual. 2. The violation of ecclesiastical laws and all those cases in which there is a question of sin in respect to the determination of culpability and imposition of ecclesiastical penalties. The Holy Spirit's admonition to believers is to be remembered as these decrees are certified into law. Quote, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In past times, kings, princes, and nations were supposed to tremble at the decrees of the Roman Catholic Church. Woe to him who resisted! Subjects were released from the oaths of allegiance. Whole states were placed under interdict. By deception regarding the gospel and subsequently by force, the papacy has held her domain together. She has only external unity, as anyone who has lived within her system and studied her decrees and history knows. Our prayer, our prayer for Croatia. We have documented on how the institutionalized papacy and the powers of darkness have conspired against Serbs, have conspired against Jews and others in Croatia. It is horrendous. Our prayer now is that the Lord Jesus Christ would show the power of his kingdom in Croatia. Psalms 2 reminds us that the Lord Jesus the Messiah reigns. His throne is not moved, whatever may be the turmoil and schemes against him. While the enemies of the gospel are plotting and planning how to break his bands asunder and cast his cords from them, he has already defeated their devices, and he says to them, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. All events are in his hands. None can stand against the Almighty Lord Jesus Christ. The voice of the Lord thunders from the final chapters of the Bible and reverberates throughout the world. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. While the papacy from the city of Rome continues to wax strong, her final condemnation is already written. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she had made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. God's reserved wrath, his punishing justice, and his enmity to sin will be revealed to the entire world. The destruction of paper Rome will proceed from the glory of his power. Quote, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Unquote. The certainty of the final triumph should animate us in our efforts and embolden true believers in their struggles. The frequently quoted maxim that, quote, peoples ignorant of history are destined to repeat it, unquote, is still true. True believers are in real danger of compromising with the Church of Rome. Without the knowledge of the horrifying history of Croatia in the 20th century, we can fail to see that the true gospel is a matter of life and death. As the Apostle Paul told believers, quote, All who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, unquote, the victory of the faith and courage of believers of the severest trials is repeatedly recorded in the pages of history. 
as the Lord proclaimed, Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. We appeal especially to Croatian people, where there is true faith and love of the Lord. There is, in the midst of all afflictions, a joy unspeakable and full of glory. God is the only Holy Father, the All-Holy One. His holiness is the distinguishing factor in all His essential characteristics and attributes. This is the reason why we need to be in right standing before the one and only All-Holy God on the terms He prescribes. The good news is that by His grace you can turn to Him in faith alone for the salvation that He alone gives by the conviction of the Holy Spirit which is based on Christ's death and resurrection for His people. Believe on Him alone, as the scripture states, quote, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Unquote. If the Lord has by His grace touched your heart in reading this account of creation history, please let us hear from you using the email address Richard M. Bennett at yahoo.com. Thank you, Richard Bennett and Michael the Semlian. And thank you, says also Jörg Blissmann from Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth. This concludes the 22nd reading of The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris and gives a conclusion, at least for the moment, for the subject of Yugoslavia or the broken-out independent state of Croatia during the time of 1941 to 1945, and the atrocities that have been made there by the Eustachi, by the Roman Catholic Church. And yeah, we did not speak about the Jesuits, but the Jesuits are always in control of the bishops and cardinals and other Roman Catholic people, who are doing all these atrocities. There were Jesuits involved and there were Jesuits pulling the strings. And that's why this reading for me was so important to integrate into the book reading of The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. Thank you very much for watching, listening, commenting and, if you want to, subscribing to my channel that you don't miss newer work that comes out. Until next time, Juggler66 from All of the Truth says, God bless you, signing off and says bye bye. A special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government. Uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation in and, and through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, 
Welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.